We acknowledge, celebrate and pay our respects to the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people of the Canberra region and to all First People on whose traditional lands we meet and work. Their cultures are among the oldest continuing cultures in human history. We also acknowledge and celebrate that many of the speakers in this series were based on other traditional lands and territories across Australia and the world. We recognise their past and present leaders and acknowledge their contribution to our collective past and futures. Welcome to Cybernetic Snacks, a speaker series featuring leading voices in the cybernetics conversation. We're currently exploring the past, present and future of cybernetics. Ethno-mathematics, system science and generative justice. Today, we're in conversation with Ron Eglash. We've asked Ron four questions. Let's get into it. Cybernetics, as you know, focuses on the bottom up rather than the top down. So uh, here's a couple of little technical diagrams for that. Um, from the top down, you have design precision and predictability. From the bottom up, you have design evolution and adaptability. And so that's the technical description. But I, I asked you for some social examples. That would be something like in governments, you can have top-down governance like authoritarian or bottom-up governance um, like democratic process. Uh, a top-down example of uh, race frameworks would be the white supremacist idea that God's plan was to put white people at the top. Um, a bottom-up version would be the long history of adaptationists um, who believe that uh, we were all uh, brothers and sisters of the same family tree, and it was merely adaptation to different environments, giving us different skin colors. A top-down version of solving global warming would be geoengineering, right? I'm going to blast these particles into the atmosphere or use space mirrors or something. A bottom-up version would be agroecology, renewable energy, regenerative industry. If I asked you to solve the economy so there's no more poverty, a top-down solution might be uh, communism or a free market person would say, well, let's have a free market where the biggest, baddest uh, corporation rules all. A bottom-up would be a solidarity economy, right? A community-based economy. So many of the founders of adaptationism in the technical sense, the, the origins of our concepts of a self-organizing system, were also the founders of social justice advocacy. Folks like Charles Darwin, um, who was a founder of evolutionary biology, but also from a long line of staunch abolitionists. Um, folks like Frederick Douglass, folks like Walter Cannon, Norbert Weiner, Gray Walter. Um, so that's what drove me to cybernetics. You know, I was in high school looking around for some sciencey thing to major in. Um, and I read Norbert Reiner's book and I realized, wow, these folks are not only, you know, brilliant uh, engineers and scientists and mathematicians, but they also give a damn. They actually care about uh, the people on the planet that we're on. Now, there was a dramatic change in the 1970s. So uh, back in the 50s, you talk about um, circular causal mechanisms, right? Um, but in the 1970s, we switched from this mathematical characterization of complexity being highest when it's most random to the idea of computational complexity and the fact that it's self-organizing systems that are the most complex, right? It's not you know throwing a bunch of particles up into the air uh, and having it randomly uh, spin around. Uh, it's when an organism is growing and evolving and, and uh, uh, there's an emergence of structure. Um, so, so that transformation in the 1970s took us to these self-generative models that include machine learning and neural nets, what we now call artificial intelligence, fractals, chaos theories, all these tools for modeling adaptive, nonlinear, self-modifying systems. Also in the 1970s, folks started taking a closer look at indigenous cultures. So at MIT, uh, Negro Ponte was heading the architecture machine group, and they came across this book, Architecture Without Architects. The light bulb went on over the head, right? Oh my gosh, that's what we need to do. And that's what created the MIT Media Lab, according to uh, uh, Stuart Brand in, in his uh, bio of ne Negro Ponte. Um, Eric Raymond, 
uh, founder of uh, open source and, and uh, this idea that we would have something like GitHub, like a Creative Commons, right, was looking at these gift economies in indigenous cultures. Um, Eleanor Ostrom, Nobel Prize winner for her work on um, common pool resource management. How do you solve the tragedy of the commons? She found all these different models in these indigenous societies. So um, it's not just the ratio club, right? There are, there are other threads you can pull on in that um, historical tapestry of, of cybernetics. Um, and many of them, I think, are much more inspiring than a bunch of stodgy old dead white British dudes around a dinner table. Anyways, um, that brings us to this question, what is it these indigenous cultures were doing that got it right? How is it that, you know, somebody in the 1970s at MIT uh, isn't yet uh, 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 grasping onto this amazing property that they have in self-organizing their architectures uh, or, or solving the, the, uh, uh, the tragedy of the commons problem? So um, if we look at uh, contemporary problems, we can see they're um, all issues of extraction. You're extracting value from nature and causing pollution. You're extracting value from labor, right? And causing low income. Um, you're extracting val value from our social network. So what Facebook is doing is, is essentially colonizing our social networks. And the value that should be returned to communities is now uh, being farmed for uh, uh, eyeballs and data. And these technologies of extraction do this very similar damage in both capitalist and communist contexts. So a lot of folks have said, oh, well, the problem is capitalism, get rid of that, you've solved it. But if you look at the history of the Soviet Union, you know, what was going on behind the Iron Curtain, uh, Venezuela, uh, 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 People's Republic of China, um, you can see the same extractive process going on, whether the value is being extracted to the state under communism or a corporation under capitalism, um, it's more or less the same thing, right? But nature doesn't extract value, nature circulates it. And that's exactly what these indigenous cultures are doing. So this is a little village in Ghana called Intanso, um, one of my favorite places to go. Uh, and you can see they're getting bark from a tree, boiling that into ink, taking the um, strained out bark and bringing it back into the forest or into compost, which fertilizes the trees that are growing the bark. And so it's this beautiful, circular economy. Um, and once you have a recursive economy, that gives you these recursive geometric structures in the architecture, right? So this, is, this gives you an explanation of why we can see these fractal structures uh, in these self-organizing architectures. Um, and once you have a basis there, there's all kinds of neat ways of using those, those fractal ideas, those recursive ideas in exploring um, concepts of heritage, right, the ancestors of the ancestors of the ancestors, um, uh, different kinds of material practices and, and so on. So this is our heritage algorithms uh, research that we've been doing. Um, still, you know, with, the, with that key insight that cybernetics has, that there's something about self-generating systems that is utterly profound. Um, and the fact that these indigenous cultures tapped into that and did it so well is something that the decolonization process now has to start taking up. So it's really a way of decolonizing cybernetics uh, is, is the challenge, I think. So if we think of Western STEM as created for the purpose of value extraction, no wonder you know, we've got technologies that have just spent the, the last uh, two or three centuries trying to fine tune its ability to suck as much value uh, out of things as possible. No wonder it's causing all that damage, right? But we can respectfully translate those mechanisms into contemporary technologies. And so after the publication of my book, African Fractals, uh, folks have been taking that up in architecture, in literature, um, in uh, dance performance, all kinds of ways I, I never really conceived of um, and I'm thrilled to see happening. Um, but that doesn't quite get at the, this idea of the grassroots, right? So how can we form these, these self-generating systems? How can we return value um, to those who are creating it? So we've created this website, Culture Situated Design Tools, where students can um, use a little block space script to do these simulations of heritage algorithms from all cultures, not just uh, African and, and African-American, uh, but uh, Native American. Uh, so we work with the, the, uh, uh, the, the Native nations that you listed, Amy, at the very beginning, um, the, the Anishinaabe groups. Um, 
uh, Latinx, uh, uh, we've done work in Africa and in India, um, even uh, 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 white heritage, thinking back to Celtic tribes, right? And what was going on there that was similar to these, these other indigenous practices. And it works, so we can show statistically significant rhythms and gaining that knowledge, right, from their own past rather than feeling like it's imposed on them. But we don't have to stop there. So we've been physically rendering these simulations. So here it is as a mannequin head um, that can go into the braiding shop. Um, here it is with our African group using um, some uh, biofoam, organic uh, um, uh, material compositions for their um, textile production. This is with one of the Anishinaabe groups, the Ojibwe. Um, and this forms a circular economy when you start involving adults. So the kids are excited because now it's that little, you know, textile shop down the street that they're working with. The adults are excited because you're increasing their, their product diversity uh, and they're, they're uh, you know, kind of upgrading the practices. That's something that involves more digital technologies. Um, this is a little company we helped start in Africa, shipping these uh, laser cutters to them. And they use our simulations for creating these shirts, but it's intergenerational. So they're you know, pairing up with auntie and grandma that have these old school sewing machines and bringing the laser cut materials to them. Um, so these circular economies are in one sense uh, involved in that gift economy circulation, right? Um, but of course your computer isn't being made by uh, creative commons. It's being made by a factory full of alienated work. But we have these little hybrid opportunities. So this is uh, Leah Beakley's uh, lily pad Arduino. Because it's open source, she was able to download the Arduino and reconfigure it in a way that made it easier for lay people to use. And it's that third quadrant where you're involved with the, the circular economy, the gift economy. You're also tapping into some of the materials from that extractive economy, but it's a money-making enterprise that can expand this side of it. Right, so what you want to do is expand the right side of that flow and shrink down the part of the economy that that's using uh, those mass productions, the, those alienated value forms. Um, and in a sense, you know, we're kind of trapped into thinking on the political spectrum of socialism versus capitalism. We need to start thinking about the orthogonal axis to that, which is the generative versus extractive access. And that can happen under either socialism or capitalism. You know, it's just as much a struggle for LGBTQ folks under uh, communism as it is under capitalism. It's just as much a struggle. If you want to do organic gardening, it's just as hard to convince the communist state to let you do that as it is to con convince the, you know, capitalist corporations uh, to give you that opportunity. So um, we think about this as a computational structure for community-based economies, for circular economies, for the solidarity economy. So we wanna have platforms, but we want those to be owned by the people who actually do the work, right? And we want those circular economies to be able to return that value. Um, so this is funded by the National Science Foundation at the US. Um, our grant is called Race, Gender and Class Equity and the Future of Work, Automation for the Artisanal Economy. Um, so one of these involves um, uh, one of my favorite textile artists in Detroit, Dawn Smith. Uh, she's working with our group using artificial intelligence and simulation tools to create these new kente cloth patterns. Those get sent to our weaver in Ghana. Um, we don't want to ship using you know, Etsy or Amazon or something. You want the platform actually owned at the grassroots. Um, but we found one of the um, African-American hairstylists had a little company that was shipping these braiding extensions. So we said, could you also ship textiles? She said, sure, why not? Um, so now she's starting her own e-fulfillment business. So we're, we're starting to start to piece together, you know, what could be that whole ecosystem. Um, like with any other technology introduction, you know, you have some use as intended, some adaptation. So this is Dawn um, adapting a laser cutter to use uh, a kind of kind of uh, uh, recycled wood, um, and this is just outright, you know, making up some new technology that we can use. In this case, it's a, a robot that does batik wax imprints. Uh, we call it the batik bot. Um, this is uh, where I was today, actually, in Detroit at the African Futurist Greenhouse, um, and so we've uh, worked with our our friends in Ghana to design something that looked kind of like an, an a, a traditional African architecture, um, but we've turned that into a greenhouse and we've got folks growing African plants there 
um, we're using this concept of funtun funafu uh, as, as I feed you, I feed myself, right? Funtun funafu um, to do energy sharing um, between the solar array that we've, we've installed onto the roof of the African Bead Museum in Detroit and the greenhouse. So when the greenhouse isn't using it, the museum uses it and vice versa. Um, and then uh, at, a, at the platform level, we're doing things like um, uh, delivery services. So we don't wanna have to have folks pay a fee every time they um, do delivery, right? That's extracting that value. We want the delivery service actually owned and run by the people who are providing the labor. Um, and so trying to figure out what does that look like? You know, it can't be like Uber where you're trying to rip people off as much as possible to make the company more wealthy. It's gotta be the reverse, right? The drivers are now in, in charge of some of the routing. Um, and so there, there's, uh, some interesting possibilities there and rethinking what it means to have a UX, rethinking what it means to have these sharing platforms. Um, and let me just close with this image here. So if we think about the problems we're facing with our societies, what should be a loop is broken, right? We're, we're a wounded society. The body, body politic is missing some parts. And so we think of these cybernetic technologies as filling in, as being a kind of prosthetic um, for restoring generative justice. And I will end there. Want more? Check out the snack pack at the link below for bonus content and resources. Ow.